Hi, welcome to another episode and actually our final episode of the season of Scorpio season. Um, I'm I'm one of your hosts, Lisa, and I'm here today with my guest, Venkat. Hey, Lisa. Uh, I am Venkat, and I am also one of your hosts, so we've decided to stop being guests on the show. So we are both now officially hosts of the show. And uh, yes, today is our final uh, episode for season one, the letter Z, right? So do you have a snack Energy. with Z? Uh, yeah, so today I am. I have a zesty mocktail. Um, I've got some lemon zest <laughs> in the mocktail. Um, pretty good. Okay. What's your I snack was thinking of uh, zesty, but uh, then I ended up with uh, big ziti. So pasta is uh, like a weird thing to eat on the show, but I, I'm going to eat a couple of spoonfuls. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very hearty snack you've got there for the last episode. Well, this is one of those frozen meals and um, I made it and I'm going to put the leftovers away. I just got a couple of spoonfuls here. Mm, I see. Cool. So uh, today I'm excited about what we're talking about. We've got um, a couple of things. We're going to do things a little bit differently this show. We're going to start with a couple Z topics and then we're going to go through kind of a callback to um, some of our favorite topics from the, the whole show. Um, we haven't picked out in advance what these are going to be, but we will, um, I guess, ad lib it as we go and see what we end up with. Um, yeah. So should we kick it off with our first Z topic, uh, which is zeitgeist? All right, zeitgeist. I like the term. I like that zeit means time in German. <clears throat> oh, is that? I didn't know that. Is What yeah. is geist in German? That I don't know. <laughs> but zeit, I think, means time, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, um, I guess it's like, you know, the nature of the times or something. So there's sort of a, it, it's a, I think of it as a, a classier way to say news cycle. Like it's, it's like as a blogger, I don't like to write to the news cycle, like events of the week. So I don't like directly responding. But Zeitgeist is kind of a classier way of saying things that are happening in contemporary times and sort of uh, how you kind of relate to them. So yeah i thought maybe it means spirit of the times um i always yeah, think of possibly. it as like like is i guess that's what i think of when i think of it as like spirit of kind of like the um underground or like not so visible vibe like collective vibe of the um of what I, you know it's and twitter's a good place to see what the zeitgeist is right because it's what people are yeah. talking about um i don't know i think zeitgeist twitter is my favorite it's hard to find though it's um, like, I love the, it became a meme, the phrase big mood. So if you just okay. search on Twitter for the phrase big mood, you see a lot of people like tweeting, like, you know, things that they feel are a big mood, right? And most of them are like kind of very personal and not really big moods. They're like what I think of as little moods. Uh, but some of them are, right? Like um, right now, I think on Twitter, the zeitgeist big mood is uh, whatever the hell is happening in Portland and uh, the weird LARPy civil rights uh, yeah. versus uh, MAGA crowd stuff. Um, that feels very zeitgeisty to me right now. Yeah, and the thing about that, I think it, the thing about Portland that kind of confuses me is like, I don't, I haven't figured out how to keep track of what's going on there. So I feel like it's like ambient, like the Portland news feels very like ambient and that I see things scrolling past, but I don't have enough context for like what the grounds of anything is like or like what the actual like you know like when you read about like skirmishes this is terrible to maybe put in <laughs> more terms but like you know when you read about skirmishes other places I guess like you know like the France had the big riots and stuff and I didn't really know what was going on there yet either um it's really hard to get a sense I guess I'm saying of of what exactly is happening there um I think, um, yeah, it's quite confused even to the people on the ground uh, themselves. The France thing was actually quite clear, though. The Yellow Jackets thing, I was talking okay. to people who keep track of France stuff, and that was basically a bottom-up uh, sort of class revolt that was triggered um, immediately by a tax, the a gasoline tax, I think. But then it kind of like petered out. But Portland is more complex. Like, I saw a couple of uh, threads where a lot of what, outsiders think of it is actually informed by the show Portlandia. Did you ever watch that show? Briefly, I couldn't really stand the Fred guy. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, that was the point, I think. He's, 
it's a cast of characters. Yeah, it's it's an annoying cast of like um, characters. So I think one external sort of theatricalized view is this is that type of person, the Portlandia kind of cast, sort of LARPing um, end times, uh, people's revolution stuff. And the other side is also doing like, you know, end times uh, LARPing. But there was another thread that objected and said, hey, that's what it looks like from the outside. But that uh, annoying, whiny, hipster crowd is only one subculture of Portland that was portrayed in the show. And this is actually all about a different subculture, which is kind of like a dark anarchist, kind of like violent overtone side of Portland. And I, mm. I've seen signs of that. I know a couple of people in that scene as well, and they're genuinely sort of committed to that kind of thing. But I can't like shake the feeling that whatever it is, it's um, you know live action role play. It's like LARPing. It's not real. Like one side is LARPing the French Revolution, the other side is LARPing some sort of like fascist uh, Nazi takeover, right? So it's, it doesn't yeah. feel real. But then it feels like it could it, get real anytime. Yeah, I was gonna say, isn't the LARP how it starts? Like he's it, like. Yeah. It was like 99% of success is showing up, even if you're like wearing your <laughs> LARP costume, like 99% of like a successful revolution is showing up in costume, like to some extent, like the yeah. spectacle like still happens. I don't know. Um, yeah. Like, and I think it's not just a spectacle for the media and like remote people like us, mm. but it's a spectacle for themselves. They enjoy it. Yeah. Like this is a point that uh, yeah, it didn't strike me as much because to me, going out in crowds and protesting on marching are like the worst things I can think of as a way to spend my time. But um, I don't know if you read uh, Ben Hunt who writes the Epsilon Theory blog, really good um, sort of um, blog. And he had a take on this, which is, uh, when you're young, especially if you're young and male, when you see this kind of thing going down, you're like, oh, this must be fun. And it'll be end times, Mad Max stuff. I'll have my guns and motorcycles and like enjoy it. And it feels actually enjoyable. And uh, it's similar all around. And everybody has a different way of relating to that kind of like theatrical event. But uh, there's a time before you kind of realize how dark and ugly it can get where it actually seems like fun. And most of the people I think participating are actually kind of like um, having more fun than they'd like to admit. And even if a couple of people die, like one of the MAGA guys got shot, right? Even if that sort of thing happens, it's like, it, it takes a lot for the fun to transform into a sense of tragedy and uh, futility, right? So we are still in the, this is LARPing end times fun kind of zeitgeist. Yeah, and I think, you know, the whole like you might get shot thing, I think like, it adds something to the experience. I wouldn't know personally, and I'm definitely like kind of like maybe talking off the cuff a little bit here. Um, Cause you know, like bullets are real, death is real, it's terrible. Like people shouldn't be shooting at each other. But if you're playing the game, if you're out there LARPing, like the, I don't know, that whole like extra aspect of violence, just, I don't know. Oh yeah, it's part of the fun. Like if there isn't a little bit of actual danger, it's not fun. That's what makes it like, a live action role play as opposed to like literally a stage play or like a movie, right? You're doing right. it live in the real right. world and it could actually get real and ugly. And this is like a part of the psychology of it. Like a lot of people have pointed this out. Uh, Francis Fukuyama's end of history and the last man theory. This is the archetype of the last man who's kind of like so bored by the end of history. Everything is drained of energy and meaning. And this is one way to try and create meaning, which is like, you know, drive up strife and conflict and try to restart history. I see. But, um, yeah, that's actually a good segue note for our next topic, zemblanity. Right? Zemblanity. The, yeah, the what sense is of... Zim, a zemblanity yeah. there, so, Bankat? So it's a word, uh, it's a, not a common word, but it's a word I use a lot in my own uh, writing and thinking. It's the opposite of serendipity. So serendipity is usually dis defined as surprisingly lucky when you're luckier than you expect to be. Things go weirdly well. Like, you know, guardian angel is looking out for you. Zemblanity is unsurprisingly unlucky when you expect things to go in a sort of pattern of predictable doom. And it actually does unfold exactly like that. It goes towards doom. And looking at things like Portland, I have this sense of strong zemblanity that things are going to shit and I don't expect to get lucky and, it, you know, surprising actions to save the day. So that's the plan you. You see, zoom, you see doom, zoom, you see zoom coming, you see doom coming and um, 
Like, uh, it's, you, there's nothing that's going to probably... Unstoppable. You can't do anything yeah. to avoid it or avert it. It's like just, you know, waiting for the asteroid to hit. So it's that mm -hmm. sense of uh, doom. Uh, I should do a shout out. Like, you tweeted uh, for topic suggestions for Z, for whoever could guess something. And, right. It was yeah. to guess what your your selection of the wisest book was in our W <laughs> edition. Yeah. And the person who got it right, um, Abraham Thomas, he's actually an old college friend and he's also a fellow for, a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide. So it's no wonder he guessed it right. But yeah, so he suggested Zemblanity as one of the topics. <sighs> yeah, so that's Zemblanity. Okay, yeah. Well, are there any, is there anything else other than Portland that you see happening right now that you would, in the zeitgeist perhaps, that you would say? Yeah, the election. Into I mean, election. Trump versus Biden is a sense of like two paths to doom that are like a distinction without a difference. And this is how a lot of people mm -hmm. feel. There's like a marginal difference in like, I don't mean in between them individually. Between them individually, I don't think there's any contest. Biden is like a better human being. But as like machines heading towards like, a bad end game in politics, like you've got the Democratic um, Party's mm -hmm. machine, and then you've got the GOP completely taken over by the Trump faction, and both are mm -hmm. heading towards this sort of ugly end game of party politics of the last 40 years. And it's like, we know something new is probably around the corner, but not in this cycle. Such not a sense of cycle. doom. <laughs> so yeah, <clears throat> that's a big sense of doom I have going. And around yeah. the world, of course, climate change, the wildfires in California, there's like lots of zemblanity going on right now. What, yeah. what about Texas? What do you sense in the air there that's zemblanitous? I mean, hurricanes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, we're in hurricane season until the end of November or like through November, I think. So um, I was talking to my dad about it. He's lived in this area for a long time now, a lot longer than I have. Um, and he was saying that his theory, we'll see if this holds, is that um, the worst and strongest storms should be through maybe the next couple of weeks to the end of summer. Um, we'll see more storms in the fall, like through October and November, but the strongest ones will probably be in the next three to four weeks. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. I don't know though. I'm like, I, so when I lived in New York City, when you went out to Long Island, there's like a good deal of surfing that happens on Long Island. And um, the, what do you call it? The um, the best time to go, scoot, like not scuba diving, to go surfing is in October because that's when the water is warmest. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to tell my dad, I think the water will be warmest in October, which would like put his summertime prediction not to be true because hot water fuels storms. Um, so I think October might be kind of bad, but we'll see. Because even though the land temperature cools down, like the the heat of the in, like the ocean absorbs heat all summer, right? And it just kind of carries through October. So we'll see. There's an interesting uh, connecting this up to zeitgeist and the idea that zeitgeist is about time. Mm. Zemblanity, I usually think of it as like a terminal end of history type of stuff, like one shot deals. But uh, what you're talking about things makes me think about like. Zemblanity as a seasonal phenomenon. Like there is like almost an annual cycle to, yeah, spring is a happy serendipitous time when you expect good things to happen and like, you know, opportunities to open up, doors to open up. And apparently yeah. in Texas, hurricane season is like a doom season where you expect things to be shitty and crap to happen, right? Yeah, I mean, it's also the summer. It's fucking hot outside. No one likes to go outside. <laughs> like, there's storms, like, there's thunderstorms a lot. It's, like, it's a, kind of a miserable whole time in Texas right now, and it will be for another couple weeks. Um, yeah, it comes every year. Unavoidable doom of the heat, hot, humid summer. Yeah. Huh. With LA, we don't have seasonal doom, but there's this uh, specter of an earthquake, the big one hanging over the whole state so that, does that feel avoidable like zemblanity is like unavoidable things right yeah i mean it's unavoidable right because um, you may not be able to predict the exact timing but it's like basic physics the crust is building up pressure it's got to give at some point you just don't know when and, and actually the feeling was even stronger in the pacific northwest in seattle because unlike california which has like tectonics that kind of like release energy uh, fairly frequently with like smaller quakes. 
the Cascadian Fault is supposed to have like this really, really big one that happens every few hundred years. So, it, and it's got vol volcanoes to add to the drama. So you've got like, you know, Mount Rainier and others. So yeah, the Pacific Northwest is bigger sort of geological time scales and blanity. But yeah, I think I would, I prefer it to the seasonal zemblanity of Texas. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I like the seasonality. It's like predictable. It comes, you know, like it arrives. There's no like, will it arrive? It arrives and you're in it. And that's like actually okay. I don't know. The whole like, I mean, when I lived in San Francisco, the whole specter of, um, of earthquakes was a lot. It was a lot to take. Like, it's just, yeah. Kind of like always. I live close to one of the trains too and our house would shake every time it passed. So that did not help. Um, the sense of foreboding. Yeah, but speaking of uh, Zemblanity, you have a painting in the background that gives me a very Zemblanitous vibe. Is that Jeff Bezos? It is Jeff Bezos. Okay, yeah. so what's the story of that painting? Like, uh, well, I found it on the internet a few weeks ago. <laughs> I bought it. I am. Um, Someone, some artist on Twitter was just tweeting it and had it out and I really liked it. So I asked her if I could buy it from her um, and it arrived a few weeks ago. I like it because it is kind of like a zeitgeisty and blanity. Like I really feel like it kind of captures like the, I don't know, je ne sais quoi of the times. Um, it it's got, like, totally does. On top of it. Um, like I yeah. think one of the things that happened last week was uh, a bunch of protesters uh, put up a guillotine in front of uh, Jeff Bezos' house in Seattle. So it was like symbolic guillotine, but that gives you a sense of like just how bad uh, uh, the inequality stuff has gotten. Like uh, It's bad. It's really yeah. bad. And like, you know, I think this is a thing that like we're not talking about, like not in the zeitgeist. Like it's a element. Oh, this, you know, like, you know, what's not in the zeitgeist is kind of an interesting question because it's like, it's like part of the reality of what we're living through, but it's not something that's like in the spirit of the times, so like the mass cultural consciousness. And I think it's like the expansion, expansion, disappearance of the middle class, like is on acceleration mode. Um, and like that is fueling a lot of the like, I think a lot of emotions and like this feeling of zemblanity, I think is yeah. like writing on top of this um, like uh, reality, which is like the middle class has basically been shot in the foot. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's a global phenomenon. Like I just read this morning, uh, Piketty, mm. the guy who wrote the Capital book, he has a new book out I think it's called Capitalism and Ideology. Mm. And the big ironic thing is that China demanded that all the sections on inequality in China be deleted uh, for it to be published in China. And he refused, so it's not going to be published in China. But there is like, I saw an excerpt uh, or his comment perhaps saying something like, it's ironic, but the best place to be a billionaire in Asia right now is actually in communist China. <laughs> <laughs> oh no oh that's terrible oh that is wow hmm. but yeah it's kind of funny because uh, when his original yeah. book came out in 2014 uh the chinese government was like all behind it it was like oh yeah inequality piketty is great he's like calling out western capitalist inequality but now in his second book that he's expanded his canvas to all over the world and he's talking about you know inequality in asia everywhere else now suddenly china is banning the book which is to me, like kind of hilarious, but that's also kind of zeitgeisty. I mean, this is what you expect China to do in um, 2020. You, this is the sort of thing you expect from China. Uh, yeah. But, all right. So, thank you. Um, all right. Moving on from uh, Zemblanity, are we ready for uh, our special segment, one? or do we have or, another? Yeah. We had one more Z topic, but we can jump into our special segment. Um, oh. We had Zen Cohen's as our. Oh, yeah, let's do Zen Cohen's. Let's do Zen Cohen's. Do you have um, a favorite one? I don't think I have a favorite one. Um, I, uh, do you have a favorite Zen Cohen? I mean, there's a few I remember. Like, uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping is the most famous um. one, I think. Uh, if you meet the Buddha on the road, you should kill him. So I, there was a time when I was really into Zen. Like, is that I, a Zen Cohen? Yeah, I think so. Why should you kill the Buddha if you meet him on the road? It's sort of like, you, you, should, you shouldn't ask that question about cones. I mean, the whole point of cones is to stop your thinking and sort of present you with a paradox that kind of like shocks you into 
uh, not overthinking it. And then that's supposed to spark enlightenment. So the cones are not mm. meant to communicate wisdom, really. I don't believe this. I think that this is how, <laughs> okay, I think that this is how people who don't understand Cohen's interpret Cohen's. Like, I think this okay. is a legitimate interpretation of Cohen's and that it's to some extent, maybe the most accessible um, approach to them. Okay. Um, so what's your uh, they, favorite? Think, what? What's your favorite way of understanding Cohen's? Or what? what's your favorite way of understanding cones? If not, I think that cone. every cohen actually has a dual-sided gem-like nature, and that you can turn it over. And when you manage to turn it over, you see the secret, like you see what it was saying underneath it. Like there's the surface level, and then there's the secondary, like reinterpretation, like mind shift level of them, like of good ones. Um, and for anyone who can't see the secondary mind shift of them, then it's like, it is exactly what you said. It's, it's like kind of like a thing that shocks you out of whatever. But if you actually can get to the point where you're able to do this duality of seeing that reality has multiple implementations, mu implementations, has multiple. Um, Spoken like a programmer. But yeah, I don't think we're actually disagreeing. It's the same thing, but uh, uh, the version I'm talking about is that the sign that you've kind of flipped polarity and are seeing sort of the other side of the duality or sort of going beyond dualism to non-dualism, the sign of that is that you suddenly are like, aha, this is my enlightened moment, en enlightenment moment or something like that. So there's a visceral side to the experience and then there's sort of a cognitive epistemic side to the experience. And uh, yeah. meditators would argue that the first is sort of the more important side of it. But anyway, yeah. But uh, I'll... I think I got into them when I read Gordel Escherbach, the Douglas Hofstadter book. He uh, has a lot of cones in the book. And then when I was in grad school, I really got into it and bought like a bunch of little, you know, books on the stuff. So yeah, for a while I enjoyed that kind of thing. It's, it, it feels like a passing phase for me though. It's like, hmm. it, I think it it's fun. no longer like zeitgeist day. Like it's out of the Venkat zeitgeist. It wasn't the Venkat zeitgeist for a while, but it was like sunset. I don't think you can talk about personal zeitgeist. Like zeitgeist is essentially communal and social. Like I think you need a minimum n equal to two for a zeitgeist. Like you and I together can have a zeitgeist on the show, but one person, it's just an opinion. I guess so. I don't know. I don't know. I like Cohen's because I feel like I'm pretty good at accidentally making them. Like I'll come up with phrases. I don't have any good examples, so I can't back this up for shit. But um, I was just about I, to challenge you. Like make up a cone right now. Have I you? What's one you've made yeah. up? No, my brain. Like they'll come out of my brain though sometimes, and like I'll tweet them out and be like, "Oh wait, there's like three different ways to look at that. That's cool." Um, All right, but when you tweet, like uh, when you tweet out the notes on the show, then you should include a couple that you've tweeted in the past. Come on, that's enough time to search out a couple and. Sure. All right. Yeah, I'll go back. I'll find at least one. It's okay. going to be terrible, though. I'm sure it's like, this is just me remembering. It's fine. Okay. I'll go find one. All right. We didn't do justice to Cohen's. I think it's like worth an, an entire show worth of like discussion. But uh, yeah, let's move on to our review portion. All right. Um, do you have something you want to... Um, oh, we should... Let's, should we talk about astrology? That was our original A thing. All right. So you start with... Uh, it's been is, six or? months. Um, we are, it's been six months. We're not back at Scorpio season yet, unfortunately, though there's questions as to whether or not we ever left it. Um, but like, I feel like speaking of zeitgeist and things that have like, I think maybe sunsetted a bit out of the zeitgeist, like I think that astrology has reached the point where it's like mass, it's like reached like mass saturation in culture. Um, mm -hmm. and is no longer kind of like, it's no longer like, conscious level it like has fallen into the background noise it's a victim of its own success I guess like we were talking about on last episode how um it's not like it peters out and dies but it just kind of like fades away I really get this vibe about astrology now I personally have moved on from astrology as my way of like classifying <laughs> humans um I'm like astrology what is it astrology is no longer dead like or no longer whatever now is I'm uh, Myers-Briggs is like my new astrology. Um, I mean, uh, we Scorpios don't believe in bullshit like astrology, right? I mean, that's the... That's no, but started. it's fun <laughs> to typify people. I like typing people. Yeah, I think I still like... The, astrology is one of those kind of things that never goes away. Like, um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been there several thousands of years. And I think anytime you have like a period when people are losing faith and like sort of rationality-based 
institutions and ways of knowing the world, they kind of retreat to superstition. And one of the sort of favorite paths of retreat is in fact astrology, because it's one of those like, you look up in the sky, like I've been doing a lot of amateur astronomy lately, uh, but you look up in the sky and it's kind of this mix of changeless uh, stuff and then the planets moving around, patterns of change. So it, it feels reassuring. That feels like a place you can retreat to where the universe can sort of, it's a place from which you can look at the world and it still makes sense. So astrology I think of as like an endemic mind infection that can be either benign or positive depending on like how you work with it. But yeah, when we started, when was it? Like April or whenever, uh, I think March, both of us, March. Yeah, so we were both, I think, thinking a lot about uh, astrology because the pandemic was just starting and it seemed like, you know, portentous astrology type thing. And I think I'm, uh, I still kind of like have fun with it, but um, yeah, it's always kind of been on the margin. It's like KFAB for me, or margin mm, between like truth and uh, reality. All right, so astrology, was that one of your favorite sort of themes for the season? I think that like, so I think like for me personally, it's definitely something like, I mean, we are called Scorpio season, right? Um, so it's definitely like something that we like, at least nominally, um, <laughs> just as, as subscribe to, ascribe to. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think it is the one though that I feel like in terms of reversion, not like reversion, but like, um, it's, it's definitely something that I feel like I have changed my mind on over the course of the season. And I think that's noteworthy. Cause that like, I've, I've been in like, not big into it. I was pretty big in astrology for a long time, but like, it's weird. Didn't feel it fading. Like it started fading out. It's like, yeah. You're the one who got me into that app. What's it called? Co-Star, I think. Uh, Co-Star, that all the yeah. millennials are, it would be kind of fun to look into that. Like has the app usage kind of, like it had like a lot of publicity when we started this. Right. And I think it might have died out. It'll be interesting to see whether they're still going strong. Right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I still get friends to sign up for it and add me as friends just because it's <laughs> fun. But like, I, I guess I used to some extent, I kind of did used to like really actually use it as like a typification of people's system. And like, I, I not anymore. Not so, much. so let me pick the next review topic. And uh, you know, we can't do them all. But I think my first pick is also from our A uh, stuff, which is aesthetics. And I think that's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, through the season. And I think my s views have kind of like, um, they haven't shifted, but I've been able to articulate them better. Like something about aesthetics in general turns me off, like aesthetic Twitter and people who are like heavily into like particular aesthetics, like, you know, uh, trad or uh, I don't know, modernist or whatever it is. And I was, for a while I was thinking of myself as like, anti-aesthetic, like almost sort of uh, same, it's the same reason I get, I like pretending or like acting like I believe in astrology or like kind of half believing in it, mainly because it pisses off a certain kind of person who acts a little too sure of themselves. Um, and it's the same thing with aesthetics. Like I like pissing off people with like strong aesthetic commitments, but I, I think I, you can't actually avoid being in an aesthetic. At most you can be sort of in an uh, like my aesthetic, I would say is like janky junkyard, like messiness. Like if you randomly throw things together, like my room is a little bit of a mess right now. Like the way a place that's actually being lived in and worked in looks like when you're sort of doing stuff. So the jankiness, I think is the core of my aesthetic. So, uh, and also sort of an aversion to any like consciously designed and harmonized aesthetic. Like if you've actually put too much thought into designing an aesthetic, you're probably my enemy. It's that sense I get. Do you think that the people who do this have a particular, you could fit them into particular Myers-Briggs type that you... Um... Uh, yeah, I think they're definitely <laughs> S over N and mm -hmm. probably F over T. Okay. Right? SF, so probably. So this but... is an NT versus SF um, kind of yeah, like... There's also a little bit of J. But you're picking. Yeah, yeah. it might be... SFJ, let me go all the way to SFJ. Like uh, it's a mix of like sensory based emotional judgment, right? That's basically mm -hmm. it, right? It's like, does the world make sense to you? Yeah, does it look pretty to you? It, it's like these people can't tell those two questions apart. Is the world right? Is it working right? Are things right with the world? Is the same question to them as, does it look pretty by my aesthetic lens? And to me, they're completely different questions. Like I can often admire like aesthetics created by ideologies that I absolutely detest. I can admire it. And to me, that's because the two are different, but the people I kind of like 
I'm very suspicious of who kind of are part of like the aesthetics, aesthetically self-defined subcultures. They tend to kind of like make no distinctions between aesthetics and ideology, which to me is a scary thing because that way lies authoritarianism. Anyway, mm. That's aesthetic. So you get the next pick. Great. Okay. Um, I think my next pick would be evilness. Um, All right. What did we say about evilness? I don't remember us talking about it. It's on the list of things that we talked about, but I don't remember exactly what we said about it because we've got a couple topics under E from last time. Um, I think that like, (laughs) one, I wish I remembered what we said. I should probably probably (laughs) go back and look it up later, but I feel like the um, zeitgeist of evilness feels very ascendant, like cartoon villains have started appearing like i feel like cartoon villains have kind of been like a background noise thing in the current administration for a long time like the kellyanne conway kind of being like maybe the prototype of like the Mm -hmm. um villain and they've only gotten like worse so to speak and like more cartoonish like the chad wolf guy who was running (laughs) the department of homeland security and heading up the like um contingency that was based out of portland i understand he's like acting secretary he's not even like the approved secretary um and then this whole new post the post new postmaster general that is like cartoonishly i think my favorite uh, cartoon villain in the trump administration is uh, betsy devos the education woman like i can't even listen to her name being spoken without thinking of like cruella deville Maybe it's because it's that French, um, like, you know, Divorce and Deville. Mm. But you, you know who that is, right? Like 101 Dalmatians, the woman yeah. who wants to, like, kill 100 dogs and make a fur coat out of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, 100 puppies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Make a coat. So that's, mm. that's the impression I get. And the funny thing is, like, cartoon villainy and real villainy is... The distinction is it's a distinction without a difference. Like whether you present a cartoon aesthetic or kind of like a more, uh, I don't know, deep, grim aesthetic, like, you know, I like the phrase grim dark. So grim dark is like evil as in like, it knows it's evil and it's like very intelligently and philosophically with depth trying to be evil. And there is elements of that too going on here, but what we're seeing, you're right. It's mainly cartoon villainy and cartoon evil. I mean, it kind of goes back to that LARPing thing you were talking about with Portland earlier, right? Like, these people feel like they're LARPing. Like, it feels like a LARP because it's like, you're like, are they allowed to do that? And then it's like, well, and they're like, well, we're going to do it any, like, we're, you know, we're going to destroy mail sorting machines, Mm -hmm. take them out of commission, like, put them in the back, whatever. And that's like, that's just so, like, it feels like a LARP of, like, what a villain would do, and yet it's happening in real time. So it's kind of like, confusing i don't know like there's so it just feels so overtly cartoonishly terrible yeah and i i was thinking about this actually like uh, over the last weekend i was watching the karate uh, karate kid uh, tv show uh, cobra kai have you watched that no no so uh, have you watched the original movies the karate kid movies I've seen the original one. I don't really Okay, know so that, it's a very cartoonish movie, right? I mean, it's very cartoon type archetypes, uh, teenage boy, teenage rival, a girl in the picture. It's all very cartoonish high school. And the interesting mm-hmm. thing about the television show is same actors, they've grown up. So Ralph Macchio, who was the karate kid, 14 year old, he's now an adult car dealership owner. And his rival, uh, who was Johnny, is now an adult kind of washout trying to re- resurrect Cobra Kai. So I won't give out the ending, but it's like a really well done, gray areas, uh, gray personalities, uh, non-cartoon drama. It's, but the interesting thing is, it keeps like having callbacks and like uh, flashes of the original cartoon characterization of these uh, players. Like, so now they're no longer like good and evil. It's not an easy good or evil kind of uh, movie or show anymore even though there's elements of that but it's cartoons that have become like full three-dimensional actors in like a adult television drama and it got me thinking about the difference between cartoonishness and sort of full 3d humanness and there isn't one like all of us have within us a sort of cartoon version of ourselves so there is this you know there's the real you, then there's sort of the presentation you that you might present on Facebook or Twitter. Then there might be the idealized you, like the person you aspire to be. But I think there's also a cartoon you. 
the sort of caricature of yourself that you sometimes degenerate into. And uh, in my Twitter feed, no, sorry. <laughs> Facebook is your idealized self. Twitter is your caricatured cartoon self, maybe. I that could be so, it, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that yeah. sounds about right, right? And, and I think this is something that you can be self-aware of and ironically fall into, but you still can't help yourself. Like there is a cartoon version of yourself that will sometimes come out. And that's a great thing about this Cobra Kai show. It's like the original movie was all cartoons. It's like, you know, animated cartoon level characterization. This new show is basically real characters, but like every episode of um, whatever, 30 minutes or whatever, there'll be a couple of minutes when they kind of like, degenerate back into the cartoons of the 80s movies. So that's what made it so fun. And the interesting thing about um, the Trump uh, regime is some of these people are like 100% all cartoon all the time. I've never seen them like rise up to human even in flashes. Like bar. Or like, Trump himself. Like Trump has Trump never himself. actually been not a cartoon, right? But other people, it's like, you know, Steve Mnuchin. He's Kind of like at some points, he's like the dark, deep kind of villain. Occasionally, he has flashes of like actual humanity. But then like 25% of the time, he's a cartoon. Betsy DeVos, I think, is like 60% cartoon. But yeah, so, all right. That's, I don't know what we said about evilness. That's actually a good sort of before-after test, going back and see if we contradict ourselves. Yeah, we'll see. I like that you also kind of touched on cartoons, which was a topic we talked about for C, So. Oh, yeah. So we got... Okay. Well, but uh, of... what would you talk about next, Venkat? Ooh, do, do, do. let's see. Oh yeah, let's talk about Faraday Cages. How's that project coming along, which we see in your background? I see in the background now. And it's kind of fun. I was looking back through some of the screenshots. You can kind of see my room take shape with like it slowly, gradually mm -hmm. like migrating in. Um, uh, it's finished. I sleep in it. I still haven't figured out how useful slash effective it is. I can use my phone from inside of it, which isn't a good sign really. Um, but the signal bars go down a little bit. So if all you're trying to do is cut some of the radiation, it like, I have some evidence that it is reducing some of my exposure to like EM whatever pulses. It also works great as like a bug screen. I haven't been bit by a mosquito while sleeping. Like, <laughs> I started sleeping it a few months ago. So I would call it a success. Um, I haven't written it up yet. Someone actually pinged me on Twitter a few days ago and was like, hey, like, Faraday Cage, did you do it? And they sent me, um, apparently there's a company in somewhere in Europe, I'm guessing because the prices were all in euros, um, where they um, sell, you can buy like a shroud. So mine is like, I built, you know, around my bed, I built, I put like basically screen the whole bed in um, with window screens, but you can buy like a kind of like a fabric, I'm guessing it's like a metal drop cloth mm -hmm. thing that you put around your bed on top instead of building a cage and then you get in and out of it and put it down while you're sleeping. And they have like a, um, a mat that you can put under your bed so it touches the mat so the conductivity does whatever. They're very expensive. It was like over a thousand euro a piece for the wow. pieces. And how much did you spend on your project? Um, I think that the like screening stuff was maybe like a hundred something bucks uh well i bought a couple different things because so i don't really know what i was doing i think you can get the screening for less than 100 dollars, like 60 70 bucks and then all the tape i got was probably like another 30 dollars. and then the um i think i have some here i use like titanium wire jewelry wire which this is probably like eight bucks a thing and i use like two or three of them so um i'd say less than 150 bucks to like put it all together okay that's not bad yeah Somebody was uh, tweeting at me about how would you build a Faraday cage for sound? And I was thinking about that. Like, could you have like a similar shield, like, you know, cone of silence kind of like concept where the boundary is a noise cancellation kind of thing? I'm I don't sure know. I don't could. think it's possible. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, it, like, it kind of depends on the range of sound you're trying to block out, right? I've seen like interesting things you can do. Like, I don't know. There's like sound dampening stuff. I think there's also like, it's really hard because really all the noise thing. cancellation stuff you have, it's a point. Like noise cancellation microphones or headphones, they can like kind of do a little bit near your ear, but you shift them slightly and they kind of like, if you've tried it, they don't work well. And I used to work in a lab in grad school that did noise cancellation research. And some of my, I wasn't into it, but 
some of my colleagues were, and they were like struggling to do like minimal level noise cancellation inside like, you know, the cabin of a crane, for example. So it's, it's much harder, I think, because the physics is different. Like uh, with electromagnetism, it's um, kind of easier in a way because you have this sort of metal layer and it sort of cancels out the Oh, it's a plain potential. surface. You're putting up a barrier. You're like, it's yeah. like building a bubble, a building a bubble. You build a metal bubble. Uh, but, but the physics are different. It's something to do with um, sort of how the you know, induced charge or something distributes on the surface or something. Yeah, but, but you, as, you construct a plane that it interacts with. But, but it's not active is my point. It's a passive sort of physics yes. phenomenon. Whereas noise cancellation is an active uh, sort of, um, you use microphones to cancel microphones by face canceling things, right? So it's kind of different. Yeah, yeah. it's more of a, a counter, like counter attacking, like there's a yeah. counter attack thing versus um, this is just passive defense, yeah. Yeah, all right, you get the next topic pick. So we are into F, I picked Faraday cages. What's your topic? Um, I would talk about guns next. Ooh, okay. I feel like I'm hitting like all the like hard, to, like not hard, but like a little bit like the Zemblanity, like zeitgeisty <laughs> things, like evilness, guns. I can't remember the other one was astrology. I guess wasn't that um, whatever. Okay. Um, I recently saw a tweet. So this has been on my mind a lot lately because I recently saw a tweet thread that was talking about how all the gun stores in California were sold out. And back when the pandemic started in March, my family that lived in Austin was talking about how. She, my sister who lived there was a little like concerned because all the gun stores in Austin were selling out of guns. Um, and it's concerning at least to my sister, um, because the, um, what do you call it? The people, I mean, these people who are buying guns, we're assuming haven't owned guns before. Right. So in theory, it's like, it's like a, the population is like arming themselves, but the, know-how and like you know gun safes like there's more people with guns like that just seems like more potential for terribleness to happen i'm not sure yeah that thread i read that too and um you know, i was actually talking about it with a couple of friends um from texas actually and i think yeah. all sort of um traditional gun nuts are making the same point that there's an entirely new set of populations buying guns for the first time they're not yeah. steeped in gun culture like I think there's some sort of uh, depth to that argument, like especially like there's parts of gun, like I'm not a strong hardliner on guns because I do think that uh, the U.S. has a particular history of like gun culture, especially in the rural parts where it's sort of a long tradition of guns as just another tool. Uh, but I do also think the U.S. Mm -hmm. fetishizes its relationships with guns in a peculiar way. And one of the dangerous things I see the traditional gun owners doing is they're kind of like they're sort of reading too much into their own cultural history with guns and sort of having a reaction coming from that place which is oh all these new people don't know how to use guns they don't know gun safety they're gonna like kill themselves and cause things to become much more dangerous this is not actually true yeah there's going to be some idiots and stuff but there's like smart people on both sides there's going to be people who pick up the right skills there's going to be like what we saw in portland bunch of them must be new gun owners as well who are going to be acting stupid but yeah it is actually concerning in a more real way that um, intelligent people who can who can potentially figure things out are arming themselves and uh, i know some on the liberal side as well like uh, who've been mm. like training with guns for like years and are really good at it they're like sharpshooters at this point so it, it's not a good sign and i think um the next four years, the U.S. relationship with guns is going to come to a little bit of a head because uh, until now, it's been so one-sided. It's been like gun nuts on one side and like, you know, whatever, 90% being owned by 3% of the population or something. Now it's more evenly distributed. It's no longer sort of a proxy for a race relations thing where it's like guns equal white and not guns equal to black kind of thing. And a lot of hypocrisies are going to come out. So it's going to get bad i think yeah I, i'm basically yeah i think the u.s should kind of join modernity and even if there's like a long history of like gun culture in agrarian settings mm. it, the rest of the world manages to get along just fine with like you know strongly controlled public gun culture and uh, um, you know armed forces and policing forces with guns and stuff so I think the U.S. can and should shift that way, but getting there is going to be pretty ugly, I think. 
Yeah, and it feels like we're going away from that. Oh yeah, and it like, could be the that proliferation. The, it could be that the U.S. is actually the leading edge to the future, and all the other countries are wrong, and they're going to like actually loosen their laws and arm up, and that would be even uglier. Like you know, World War Three, where the weapon of mass destruction is small arms, not nukes. nukes. Yeah, but it's kind of that like guerrilla, like weirding kind of thing, right? Where it's not like the destruction of the future doesn't come from some like big armament or like large superpower it's like the destruction of the superpower and the rise of like the militia like the um the mob man the i don't know like like i think it's one of those things that if i could like invest stock in like the underworld slash the mafia right now i would be (laughs) investing in the mafia because i think that that's like that kind of style of power is gonna is is ascendant oh that's already the case like trump's administration is basically a mafia type administration and a lot of people have made this connection both yeah. uh, allegorically and literally like he has mob connections and even he if has he mob connections. oh yeah totally and he, he, there's like probably active mob stuff going on but even without yeah. that his style of running the government is a mob style like you know intimidation shows of loyalty that kind of stuff family i mean how many of the rnc speakers were related to him or dating his son <laughs> ah, 50 percent like- yeah at least 50, right? I mean, it's a yeah. family-run organization. And the reason for that is, like, trust, right? Like, it's a loyalty thing. Like, who do we trust to, like, be in the club? And it's it's not just going underworld with, like, mafia culture replacing, like, above-ground public culture. Even with guns, you could sort of expand that to all technology is potentially capable of violence. It's a question of, are you using it? Like, you look at the civil war in Syria, and these um, people, like just random people, they were like finding uh, like undetonated shells coming from the Syrian government. So these are the rebels, I think. Uh, undetonated shells and like rigging up Arduinos to like uh, detonate them again and using them as bombs to throw back. Like smart people with a bunch of like random technology lying around and enough raw material, they're going to find ways to blow shit up and like, you know, make explosives out of anything. Like, uh, uh, my father-in-law actually, um, he, who passed away last year, he was an explosives uh, guy in the Air Force, so you know, bomb disposal kind of stuff. And uh, he told me like you know, things about bomb culture. Like one of the things I learned from him is almost any substance can be an accelerant if it's like powdered finely enough. Oh, I mean, that's yeah. the sort of thing that uh, people pick up on. And like you go online, Reddit forums, you pick up like half a dozen of these things and suddenly whether or not you're a gun owner, you're capable of like creating a lot of violence. So in a way it's like well, yeah, false sense of security to have, um, to ignore that. Yeah, and you know, I mean, like thinking about it, it's like more violence isn't the answer. Like, what's the answer? Well, to me, I'm like, it's like it kind of goes back, I think, to like the um, there's a little bit of an ideology. Like, ideology matters, right? Why are people picking up guns? It's because of their ideology. Um, how do you get people to put guns down again and like stop with making bombs? It's a little bit of like ideology, right? Like, how do you believe? Why? What's your rationale oh, yeah. for doing it? And what's justifying those? Um, so uh, on that prompt, I'm going to again re-up the Karate Kid show Cobra Kai because that's okay. the sort of running theme of the show. So Cobra Kai is the evil dojo which believes in like, you know, uh, what is it? Strike first, strike, no mercy, that whole shtick they had. And then the Miyagi dojo is like all about karate is only for self-defense and all the peaceful stuff. And the whole yeah. show kind of like takes those cartoon genre of martial arts tropes and sort of actually plays with them in an interestingly adult way where the two seasons that are out so far, it shows that playing out, like how that plays out in like everyday ordinary life. All right, so that was guns. I pick next, should, I think. Yeah, I think we've got maybe like 10 more minutes. Do you want to pick like one more each and then call it? Yes, let's pick one more each and let's pick uh, pick an easy one. So we've kind of like stayed in the early stuff. So let's go towards um, okay i'm going to go to q and quixoticism so quixoticism is i don't know what we said about it but um you know i i think i've only ever read an abridged version of don quixote but okay. the whole idea of like uh, tilting at windmills and larping the culture that's no longer there either ironically or unironically uh, that sort of keeps coming back 
into my head. I, I guess it's part of my aesthetic. So it's part of like, you know, the junky, uh, messy aesthetic. There's also an element of like quixotic questing to that and uh, a kind of like messier version of uh, LARPing without a script. So that's in a way, quixoticism is that. It's LARPing, but without a script in kind of like an improvised made up way with whatever the hell is at hand. So you mm -hmm. think you're living in like medieval um, knight errantry times, you mount a horse and then go around trying to kill dragons. There are no dragons around, but you spot a windmill and you go tilt at it, right? So there's like a LARP element, but it's improvised. It's like randomly making up um, stories about stuff in the environment. I, I think that's part of my aesthetic somehow right now. What would you say you're like quixoticing on? Like, so what, maybe we could like preview, this would be a good opportunity to preview next season. Um, oh yeah, that's actually a good uh, prompt there because I think a lot of what I'm, so previewing next season, we are going to be making it a themed season. So this season has <laughs> been like a alphabetical romp through like completely random topics that occur to one of us. Uh, next season will still be an alphabetical romp, but with like some sort of focus. And the focus we've decided is since both of us kind of enjoy, uh, I don't know, DIY stuff, making, hacking, playing around with tools and crap. Uh, Lisa is much better at it than I am. So I was thinking of like uh, the show Tool Time from the 90s with uh, the show within a show. Uh, sorry, the show was Home Improvement and the show within a show was uh, Tool Time. And mm. Tim Allen plays the sort of bumbling DIY guy who like... Uh, tries ambitious things and then hurts himself and blows things up. And then Al is the guy who actually knows um, what's going on and uh, sort of saves the day. So mm. we're going to try and hit that vibe next season. And we're still arguing about who gets to be Tim and who gets to be Al. But yeah, um, that's going to be the theme. And I think, uh, yeah, connecting it up to quixotic stuff. I think uh, a lot of what I'm doing right now, it's, it's actually an alternative to guns as my way of LARPing the end times with, you know, prepper culture. So I just bought a 3D printer and I haven't soldered anything in like 25 years since grad school. I just mm -hmm. got a soldering iron and I'm going to like play with electronics again for the first time in like you know, decades. So, you know, part of it is like, part of me is laughing at the other part of me as in you really think if uh, shit hits the fan, having a 3D printer to print random parts is going to help you? Probably not. So in that sense, it's a LARP. But on the other hand, it's kind of fun to do and it kind of could help. Like, you know, in the pandemic, we saw that uh, when supplies were low, a lot of people were printing face shields. A lot of 3D printer owners were printing face shields. So it's some kind of more boring version than, you know, 3D printing your own gun. But it's kind of like a useful tool to have around when the supply chain is unreliable and stuff like that. So I've been, we'll talk more about it at one of the episodes in the next season. But yeah, I have a 3D printer now. So that's my, one of my quixotic LARPs uh, that I have going on. All right. So w what are you doing right now that's quixotic? I don't think I have any quixotic stuff. Oh, going come on. on right Your now. Faraday cage is quixotic. I know. That's like finished. <laughs> it's like done. I don't think I have any quixotic stuff. I've actually been kind of struggling with getting things done lately. I don't know where my brain has been. It hasn't been around. It's been like off doing, I don't know what. Um, so your big mood is not quixotic my big More mood practical. is like not existing i don't know doom scrolling something like that some <laughs> like yeah i don't know man i don't know where the time goes these days um all right what's your final topic yeah so this is kind of you know it feels like a big uh topic to have to pick the last one um i think i'm gonna go with universe um maybe we can talk a little <laughs> talk a little bit about like the um you know we've we finished a season now the scorpio season universe i feel like it's sort of been created we're like existing in it we have like themes that have run through um i think we've done a good job of staying pretty zeitgeisty with our topics um so yeah i guess like if um hmm, let's see where can we go with this like uh the universe of scorpio season um i guess yeah would you say there's like recurring characters that we have like i guess we talked through some of them already yeah and i would say universe is actually literally the scope of season one like we literally talked about everything from like the literal physical universe to quantum mechanics and even the approach we took of like the alphabetical romp that was inspired by you know the wow bagger character in um, hitchhiker's guide who's an immortal who can travel through time and he goes around insulting people in alphabetical order across the physical universe, right? So that's 
a pretty large scope of uh, what universe can uh, mean. And I think next season will be kind of challenging because uh, even though we are focusing, I like the idea of like having a place to view from, but not necessarily restricting what you look at from there. So there's this uh, quote I like, I think it's by George Wald, maybe the biologist, but something mm. like a biologist who used to work on the uh, biology of um, retinal eye cells. And it's a very narrow specialized topic, but there's a famous quote by him that says something like, it's like a narrow window. And as you get closer and closer to, you know, the biology of cells or whatever, through it, you okay. can see the whole universe. So I think that's kind of what I'd like to try and do next season, which is we might be looking through a narrow window of like tools and maker stuff and DIY stuff. But yeah, we should be able to look at the whole universe through that, whether it's, you know, David exactly. Deutsch or culture wars or whatever. Yeah, not an ambitious thing for next season at all. <laughs> um, so like to, I guess to kind of wrap that up then, so uh, we are going to try and have more guests on next season, um, expanding the universe with uh, new characters a little bit. Um, so if you as a listener have any um, DIY home hacks or cool projects that you think might be a good fit for a next season, um, please reach out to either me or Venkat or, you know, Scorpio Season TV on Twitter um, and let us know kind of what you'd like to show off. Um, cool. And so then we're going to take a break. This will be our last season or last episode for a while. Um, and we're going to start back up on October 23rd, which those of you who have your astrology can calendars handy will recognize as the official start of Scorpio Season. Um, so yeah, we will be back. Oh, and we're going to have a website available as of today, um, <laughs> which will be, uh, you can check out our highlights from our first first season that we're wrapping up today um, at ScorpioSeason.tv. Um, cool. All right, ScorpioSeason.tv, October 23rd. We'll be back with uh, season two of Scorpio Season. Contact either of us for, uh, if you want to get on the show with your show and tell and yeah. uh well what is the last thing ah, never mind yeah so all right it's been uh, great doing this first season thanks yeah. lisa thanks for being on the show yeah thanks for being on the show man cat all right i look forward to seeing you next season see you next bye. season bye scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh smoke and screws the premium filter for your glass pipes water pipes and one hitters Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.